Uh, our next speaker is Jerry, Jerry Tallowin from Rothamsted, and he's going to speak on the biodiversity value of grassland, actual and potential. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to Sustainable Food Trust for inviting me along. And also thanks to Mark Eisler, who actually introduced it by showing that global picture with biodiversity loss as being a mega, mega issue now, generally. And I, I think bringing it back to the... Sorry, I'll learn the, the system in that. The fact that grasslands in the UK are such a dominant land use, seven, in the order of 7 million hectares, which means, if you consider that, that grassland management, the waste management, has an enormous potential to influence the biodiversity capital of this country. But when you look at the figure that less than 2% of our lowland grasslands has any biodiversity value now, uh, that's a pretty uh, staggering uh, uh, figure because it means that, in fact, we have got a, a very limited resource of high nature value grasslands, which we now have within our UK uh, resource of really good wildlife areas. And these high biodiversity or uh, wildlife rich grasslands put severe constraints on farms in terms of the management they can apply. They all can only exist under relatively low or very low levels of disturbance or intensity of management. So you've got, for example, mid to late season hay cutting or extensive grazing. Now, I will leave the extensive grazing one because I think there's a lot of areas where we can actually look at that and question some of the existing principles about grazing management of these grasslands because I don't think we're yet to learn all the lessons we could from that. But nevertheless, severe constraints on the farmers of what they can or cannot do. And the other severe constraint is the amount of nutrients or fertility that these grasslands can exist under. With this graph here, which you can see the numbers of species per metre squared against the kilograms, total kilograms of nitrogen uh, input per hectare, you'll see a very clear cutoff at about 50 kilograms of N total, above which you will, be, you will have very species poor grass dominated communities. So the vast majority of your grasslands are very restricted in terms of. The, the fertility levels that they can operate under. A similar graph I could have put, put up for phosphorus. Now, I've talked about plant diversity there, but what's the impact in terms of faunal diversity of grasslands? And this graph, which was provided to me by Ben Woodcock and co. from CH, just shows the clear relationship between forb diversity, and by forbs I mean broadleaf species the richness, against the herbivore species richness of the y-axis. And there you can see a very clear and positive relationship between um, plant diversity and invertebrate diversity. In terms of pollinator diversity and abundance, and by pollinators I'm talking about butterflies, bees, hoverflies, so the whole guild of the pollinator community. Again, a highly significant relationship between the diversity of plants, in particular flowering plants, and the pollinator community. Unfortunately, agri-environmental agri schemes, and particularly the entry-level scheme, where farmers are paid a compensation for low or no inputs of nitrogen, they dominated the agri-environmental uh, payments uh, countrywide, and yet their impact on providing biodiversity benefits were pretty low. In fact, the EK2, the low-input grasslands, are shifted very little from grass domination over the years of uh, the farmers who entered that scheme and taxpayers paid for it. Now, we have a vast resource of this uh, species-poor, grass-dominated community. And in about 2007, I, along with colleagues from CH, were invited up to DEFRA to look at what we could do to improve the value for wildlife of this enormous resource. And some of the colleagues in uh, Natural England at the time said, well, how can we diversify the boring grasslands that we have got an abundance of in the UK? 
And it was recognised, and our research has shown that in order to achieve highly diverse communities, is very costly, very time consuming, and very uncertain. You've got to achieve soil phosphorus levels around zero, maximum the lower one index. You have that nitrogen input constraint as well. So, and, and also soil organic matter uh, quality issues as well. So those communities at the bottom right hand corner are incredibly difficult to restore. But we argued, why not try a halfway system? We've done a review with Reading University, the British Trust for Ornithology, to say within our grass and suite of species, common species, are there species that could provide good agro agronomic value, wildlife value, and other values? And the review is quite widely available now, but it, was, it identified that we actually had potential for sowing mixtures of plants that could give us a win-win um, result. So we set up an experiment. It was called the Web Experiment, Wide-Scale Enhancement of Biodiversity on agri Agriculturally Improved Grasslands. And we had three mixes. The first mixture was just grasses only, and we sowed high-sugar grasses, we, uh, a, a range of ryegrass varieties, festulolims, etc. So it was quite a complex mixture of grasses. We also sowed a mix of legumes, including red clover varieties, white clover varieties, uh, rib melilot, uh, sweet clovers, uh, lotus, and also sandfoin. And then in addition to the grass mixture and legume mixture, we sowed some uh, forb species, broadleaf species, including chicory which we identified as having the potential for some anti-helminthic properties. Also things like forage burnet, uh, yarrow, and, uh, and also common sorrel. So there was a mix of species there, all identified by the review that the colleagues at Reading University had done, and ourselves. And then we applied two different managements. One was a typical intensive cutting management, and the other one was a typical intensive continuous grazing, uh, grazing management with beef cattle. We also applied, within each of these uh, communities, we took out small areas of the paddock and gave them a rested period in the middle of the, of the summer, eight weeks, with no disturbance whatsoever. The idea was to provide uh, an, a forage pollen nectar resources for uh, bees, butterflies, and hoverflies. So there was, we call this one the intensive and the extensive systems. Now this figure, we, we sowed it in 2009, and it went for four years, which is actually quite long term for some of the funding. And what we see... <laughs> Sorry, a bit of a <laughs> What we see here at the top, and these figures down the y-axis actually relate to the numbers of bees or pollinators, bees, hoverflies, butterflies, counted over a set transect over a set time period at optimal conditions for those flying insects. So warm, calm, sunny uh, conditions. So these are the numbers. Well, the grass only mix. In no year did we really see anything pumping off the bottom line. They were, they were very, very poor. Introduce legume mixtures into that system, and what we see was that over time, significantly more compared with the grass only, but over time they declined, the legumes declined perhaps a little less, in, in, certainly in the cutting with the extensive uh, rested plots. But the bottom line shows that the addition of those forbs, the non legume forbs, compensated for the legume and prolonged the period which which these pastures were useful um, for these pollinator communities. And the same story for rich, uh, species richness, pollinator species <coughs> richness. So we have a pasture here, a grassland, that really is pretty damn good for this whole guild of insects. So we proved the point. There was a potential for these communities to provide a biodiversity value now, what's its value for farmers? Four-year-old, this is on a farm, a commercial farm, up on the Mendips. This is a four-year-old 
species or moderately diverse community with chicory, red clover, all the things we sow. This is the second cut, so you can see a pretty good yield. And if I say the yields we got from our studies down at Northwick and up in Berkshire, the other site for the web project, were about eight tonnes of dry matter per hectare in total. The farmer here was achieving in the region of 10 to 12. I mean, in terms of his quality, he was feeding to sheep and he was feeding to beef cattle. And I asked him, so, you know, any problems? What do you think of it? He said, the animals do pretty well. Well, from our work that we'd done down at uh, Northwick, we found that on such communities, we had beef cattle growing at over a kilo per day consistently during the grazing season. So I, I would argue that they actually do all that we wanted. The farmers were, uh, were pleased with it, but it was only one farmer. And this work was sponsored by the Somerset Wildlife Trust in a project which they called the Seas for Change. They would dearly love to see this expanded across the countryside uh, far more. And it is a case of getting farmers to talk to farmers to say, it works for me, it's pretty damn good in terms of its production uh, potential. In terms of that rested plots, or what I call the extensive plots, he, the farmer wasn't interested in putting paddocks in the middle of his fields, so he put them along the margins, and there was a footpath beside that. So the margins actually had quite a big impact in terms of the visibility, the aesthetics, and the farmer was perfectly happy because he could manage those very easily indeed. And I mentioned earlier on this whole idea of multifunctionality uh, in grasslands. So and it, this is a very simple theme that I want you to go away with or discuss. Modest diversity increase has enormous potential for increasing the, the ecosystem services that we can have wide scale across commercial farms throughout the UK. We've tested on heavy clay soils, and it was pretty good. We've tested it on, the farms have tested on these freely draining, draining limestone soils. So it, it works, and what we've seen is it has a value at a landscape scale level, potential value. It has a, certainly a very high value from a biodiversity level. Agronomically, it's good. Resource protection, there still needs more research in terms of soil effects, in terms of structure, stable carbon pool, and in terms of reducing erosion uh, pollution risk. So there's, there's more that we could or should be doing in that area to quantify empirically the value here. But also, I think from a socioeconomic and human health, there are other issues. <coughs> there's a very rapid ride through what I consider is a potential for improving the biodiversity value of agricultural grasslands. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, where's Abby? So Abby Burns is from the RSPB, and she is going to address the theme of livestock, a perspective from RSPB. Sounds logical. <laughs> Firstly, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to talk today. Um, I think it's been really good and it's, um, it's really refreshing to have a wider ranging discussion um, about the role of livestock. I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the importance of livestock farming as an issue from the RSPB's point of view as a nature conservation organisation. Um, on a personal note, before I worked in environmental policy, my earlier professional uh, life was spent carrying out research in livestock production, particularly in the more intensive sectors with monogastrics. And since then, I've seen quite a range of extensive grazing systems here and um, overseas as well. And what that's taught me is the complexity of, of livestock systems. I think that's something that Lawrence um, referred to earlier, but I think it is really important. And that complexity makes it really dangerous to, um, to remove issues from that wider context and to take a siloed approach, say, to um, reducing methane emissions without um, considering the picture in, it, um, in its entirety. So why is livestock um, an important issue for the RSPB? Which, do I click on the bottom? Okay, thank you. 
Um, so when we consider livestock production, we immediately come across this apparent paradox um, that on one hand, livestock can um, deliver important environmental benefits, but at the same time, the sector as a whole is a major cause of environmental degradation. And we've heard a lot already today about the negative impacts on, of livestock production. In terms of biodiversity loss, inappropriate livestock production is um, a major cause. It has a sort of leading role in the current biodiversity crisis um, and contributes directly or indirectly to all the major drivers of biodiversity loss, being a major contributor to climate change, to reactive nitrogen pollution, um, land use change um, and degradation and so on. There have been estimates that around 30% of human-induced terrestrial Biodiversity loss is, is due to livestock production, and those impacts are projected to get worse um, in, you know, in relation to growing demand. Um, in the UK, livestock production is considered, both in the lowlands and the uplands, to be a key cause of biodiversity decline, and particularly in the uplands as a, as a cause of habitat degradation. On the other hand, and the flip side of the coin, if you like, is that many of our most cherished species and habitats are dependent on livestock grazing. Our most valuable farming systems for biodiversity are all, almost without exception, certainly in the UK, associated with grazing livestock. Um, so it would come as a surprise to many that some of the most threatened habitats in Europe are actually farmland habitats. Um, that those habitats associated um, with grazing livestock, 20% of habitats on Annex 1 of the Habitat Directive um, are pastures and meadows. Livestock, of course, also have other important roles um, in terms of closing nutrient cycles. And for the RSPB on our own estate, they are our most important management tools. So they have a key role in maintaining key habitats like um, lowland heath, salt marsh, upland heath and grasslands, lowland wet grassland um, and so on. We have around 30,000 livestock grazing our reserves. I just want to say a word about efficiency. I mentioned the complexity of livestock systems. It's been become quite common um, to talk about production efficiency as a proxy for the whole environmental impact of a system and we're concerned about that. Um, firstly, because in terms of the inputs to the system, we feel, and this has been touched upon this morning, that quite often the less direct impacts of more intensive sectors are not fully attributed to the system, particularly in terms of feed and land use change. But equally, in terms of the output from a system, there's a real focus on, um, on meat or other livestock products rather than um, recognising the multifunctional nature, particularly of extensive livestock systems. So extensive grazing will very often be on agronomically poor land, marginal land, but it might be exceptionally important from the point of view of the other services it's providing for society in terms of biodiversity or landscape, carbon and so on. Um, so we feel that efficiency doesn't capture all those environmental impacts and it's dangerous to take a siloed approach, for instance, suggestions to um, increase feeding maize silage, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from ruminants, when there are real problems with source protection with maize, but also it's a really challenging crop from a biodiversity point of view. Staying on this theme, really, um, we did some carbon footprinting um, at Tarn House, a large livestock um, farm on um, our Geltsdale Reserve. There were 500 breeding ewes, around 100 um, suckler cows and we looked at footprint using a range of calculators um, and what we found is that they give quite different results they have you know different boundaries different things considered although in fact none of them um, incorporated what we thought were the most important aspects in terms of carbon stewardship of our land management there by um, introducing sensitive land management and a sensitive grazing um, regime and restoring habitats we felt that those those aspects um, weren't captured in addition, um, the grazing regime, particularly actually an increase in cattle grazing, was really instrumental in delivering, delivering biodiversity benefits there for waders and for black grouse, for instance, which have increased um, very much in number compared to in the North um, Pennines generally, where they're still in decline. Um, and you know, that's grazing by hardy breeds on unenclosed land, which you know, would be considered carbon inefficient by many, particularly as they're feeding on, on unimproved pastures, but they're delivering a lot of other benefits. Um, 
I said in the lowlands, um, changes in livestock are considered a key cause of biodiversity declines. I'm not going to say too much about this because Jerry's covered things um, <coughs> very comprehensively um, before me. Um, in fact, local extinctions of farmland birds have been more common in pastoral areas um, than in arable areas, although there's been more focus on arable areas. And many species that were <coughs> widespread in the past have now become um, scarce or extinct. And um, that, that's due to this um, real loss of diversity of different habitats, so um, unimproved species rich grassland and <coughs> beneficial forms of arable cropping that just created a mixture of habitats and allowed for the needs, particularly the feed needs, but the nesting needs of birds through the year. Um, and they've been largely replaced in many areas by um, ryegrass-dominated swords and maize silage and a much more sort of homogenous um, environment. Um, this, this work, um, looking at ways to mitigate this, for instance, um, different types of grazing management, is carried out by my colleague Dave here um, in the Black Jumper. Uh, <laughs> um, so if you want to know any more detail on that, then, then please do um, ask Dave. Um, he's also been, been involved in research looking at um, other mitigation measures that can be put in um, to tackle um, these, these um, real issues in terms of providing for biodiversity in grasslands with this high um, utilisation. Um, grass silage, for instance, under typical management, acts as an ecological trap for skylarks because they tend not to um, nest in grazed habitats and they're attracted into, uh, into the fields, but then they have very low productivity due to high rates of um, nest failure. So looking at whether there's mitigation measures that can be um, put in place for issues like that. Um, moving to the uplands, um, historically um, there have been um, real problems with ha habitat degradation due to inappropriate agricultural and forestry production payments. Um, sheep numbers in particular still are high from a historical perspective, but there have been increasing concerns that in some areas um, declines in livestock numbers could be leading to um, problems for biodiversity. And we sh shared those co um, concerns, particularly in relation to suckler cows, um, because um, we'd heard anecdotally the biggest declines seem to be happening in the most severely disadvantaged areas, which are generally likely to be the areas that have most value for biodiversity. Um, but we felt that um, actual data was lacking on, on what was happening. So we commissioned some research, um, Cumulus carried this out for us, looking to the finest um, spatial resolution possible at how cattle and sheep numbers had changed in the uplands um, across the four UK countries. Um, it was actually surprisingly difficult to find that out. Um, I haven't got time to sort of go into all the details. I've, I've got a copy of the report with me, so if anyone would like a copy, then, um, then let me know. But there's some really interesting stuff in there, actually. But sort of in broad terms, what they found is that there have been really different patterns of, of changes in cattle and sheep numbers in different regions. So in some areas, like the Western Isles of Scotland, there have been... Um, really large declines, where actually in other regions there have been an increase in grazing pressure, so it is really quite a mixed story. The other thing the research found that we already knew, but it's very important, is that it's not all about numbers. Um, it's also about the type of animals and the, and, and the timing of grazing. Um, so, for instance, there's a move to less cattle, less mixed grazing, more continental breeds with um, high nutritional, requi nutritional requirements, and that's been linked to a polarisation where quite often there's less grazing on the hill and there's an intensification on the imbi, um, potentially with negative impacts for biodiversity. So these changing farming practices bring me to high nature value farming. High nature value farming systems are those where the productive land itself is particularly beneficial for biodiversity. So pretty much any farm with sympathetic management can deliver benefits for biodiversity, but it's often about trying to put, find ways to put that back in. With high nature value farming, it's actually the farming practices themselves, such as stocking at low densities, um, um, traditional hay mowing, maybe rush cutting and so on, which are actually creating um, the high nature value. And, and in the UK, um, it's almost all associated with low-intensity beef and sheep farming in the uplands, although there are ex some examples in the lowlands of beneficial mixed or um, coastal grazing systems, for, for instance. Um, HMV is found in all the four UK countries, 
Um, there have been estimates that it's around 25% of farmland, but, it, but that very much varies. So in some areas, like um, in the Highlands and the Western Isles, um, it's over three quarters, where in other areas um, there's none. So these systems are really special. They're really important for delivering for a range of biodiversity, like great <coughs> yellow bumblebee, the curlew, for instance. Um, and not just in the UK, across the EU, particularly with some of the newer member states where there are large amounts of, of high nature value farmland. Um, three quarters of European butterflies depends on extensively managed grasslands. Um, but it is predicted that in less than 20 years, a quarter of HMV grasslands could be lost. Because, I mean, generally, th these um, are hard places to farm. They're a long way from market, etc. Um, and they're vulnerable to twin pressures from intensification and also from abandonment, or increasingly both happening actually on, on the same farm. And they're delivering a wide range of public goods in addition to biodiversity very often, but these um, are not rewarded either by the conventional market or by public policy um, largely. There should be an easy solution to this. The Common Agricultural Policy spends €1 billion Euros of taxpayers' money a week in the EU. Um, you'd have thought HMV farming would be a prime example, um, being economically vulnerable but delivering a lot of public goods are the kind of system that should be supported. In fact, the CAP has done very little for HMV farming and in some cases has actively penalised it, for instance, um, because of features that have um, wildlife value not being eligible because <coughs> the hedges are too wide or there's too many trees per hectare or whatever. And not in small part, that's because HMV farmers and crofters generally don't have much political voice. Um, so we were really pleased to be involved with a coalition um, of farming and environmental organisations calling for um, more awareness of high nature value farming and trying to improve, improve the visibility of high nature value farming. Um, I'll be honest with you, some of, um, some of our organisations, we don't agree on everything. Um, Sometimes it's quite hard to even be in the same room on certain issues. But on this we did agree and we felt that it was really, really important. Um, so we produced um, a website to act as a hub for HMV farming in the UK. And we had a series of events, sort of farm walks and events in seats of government and so on. Um, we also produced a manifesto for high nature value farming, um, which, which goes through what um, everyone from government to the farming sector to NGOs can do better to support high nature value farming. Um, and one, um, one event in particular sticks in my mind that we had in Westminster where we had a bunch of HMV farmers from um, around the UK come to talk about what was special about their farming systems, but often also the challenges that they face. So we had someone from Shetland, someone from Fermanagh in Northern Ireland, someone from Wales. Um, and actually, um, one of the farmers, Patrick McGurn from Fermanagh, he spoke about how as a... As a child, he vividly remembers being kept awake by corncrake, and his children had never heard that, but he felt that they would actually be the last generation to hear curlew because it's declining at such a great rate, um, and you know, there were real economic difficulties with his farm. So, um, I mean, that really shows the urgency of the situation. I just want to finally mention um, a new initiative that um, we, along with actually quite a few of the organisations here involved with, with nine other organisations, from the environment and from food and public health, um, calling for um, a reframing, really, of the debate on food and farming, and particularly an opening out of the debate, hopefully, to get the public um, more engaged with the issues. And livestock farming is an imp important part of that. So in relation to livestock farming, um, we think there needs to be a focus on asking the right questions about what a resilient farming system would look like, about recognising that multifunctional nature of livestock farming and the limitations of the current sort of narrow approach um, to efficiency. Um, the report's called Square Meal. It's on the Food Research Collaboration website and there is a sort of a public debate on there with social media you can leave comments. So please don't go along and um, read the report and leave some comments to let us know what you think. I was getting faster. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, uh, our last speaker is Matt Reed from the University of Gloucester. Somebody, somewhere, will need to make these changes and do it in their farms, on their land, in their way. And that takes us to questions of who we are, who they are, and what we're doing. And so this is a simple presentation. Um, I'm afraid there are no numbers. I will not mention conservation. I may barely not mention nature and certainly not the S word of sustainability. 
Um, but when Richard and I were talking, it reminded me of about a dozen years ago, I was working in the Badlands to the west of Wyke, uh, doing a longitudinal su study. Um, we were revisiting farms who'd been interviewed 20 years before, and we were interviewing them again. And this was very interesting, classic social science, longitudinal study. What made it more interesting was that these poor people had had foot and mouth disease and had lost their animals. So I visited farms with empty barns, silent barns, cleared out, no, no animals at all. And in the bank account of these farmers was all that money, in like a perverse lottery ring. You know, you had to make up your mind, what are you going to do? Now, if my boss watches this, should that happen to me, my newly purchased Maserati will be heading to northern Italy, that will be it. These people had a profound decision to make, and they bought more animals. They went back into farming. They started again. And as social scientists, that's really interesting, that strength of identity that, given a choice that few of us will ever be faced with, people chose to go back into farming. So that sort of raises questions for us about the identity of farmers. What does it mean to be a farmer? Because many people will say, I'm struggling to get farmers to do the policy that I want them to do. I'm struggling to sell them something. I'm struggling to get them to do something that I would like them to do. So when we start to break down the identity of somebody in a farming situation, and we also use this term farmer, and I've probably never met a farmer. People do not farm individually. This idea of the economic monad, the person who makes a decision on their own, doesn't exist. There's somebody out there who's embedded in a family. Either the family that's around them, or the family of the past, they're looking to their grandfathers, the people who came before them, who farmed, who brought them to that situation. Or they're looking to the future, the little rug rat running around on the floor, the twinkle in their eye, the aspiration that there will be another generation one day. People are embedded in a family. And that so often determines what they're doing. That's what the farming system is determined by, the need for cash, the not the need for cash. The fact that now they can't actually get up at four o'clock in the morning and milk anymore, they're just too tired with it. You know, so what happens around the family is of huge importance. Then occupational culture, occupational identity. Think about it. There's a whole set of clothes, and that's before we move on to the toys and kit. You know, there's special, special places that farmers can go to be with other farmers and reinforce their identity. Yeah? That's a very, very strong thing. As one person said to me, as he was debating whether he went back into dairying, real men milk. <laughs> yeah, this is about Pete's earlier, you know. There's a certain machismo, a certain swagger, you know, I can get up at four o'clock in the morning and do this, can you? And I'm, no. <laughs> There's also a community identity. Very often, in intergenerational family farming, you're looking at people who've lived alongside each other for generations. Went to school with one another, lived with one another, intermarried, all of those things, very powerful. If you talk to people who leave farming sometimes, that's a real problem, because what do you say to your friends? And also your friends will quietly put pressure on you, because if one of you gives up, what does that say about the others? That's a very strong community pressure. And also the farmed environment. Now, um, I'm very pleased to say I, I have an O level in biology. It's my top scientific qualification. Um, so I learned a lot today. But if you talk to many farmers, they do not view the farmed environment in quite the same way. They don't view it through the lens of science. They view it through the lens of their family and their culture. So they will often talk about fields worked by their father or their grandfather. They narrate the farm. They narrate nature in a different way. And many of them will freely say that they only know a certain limited range of birds, a certain limited range of plants. And then after that, they know there's a certain degree of nature, but they don't know what it is. So they look at nature in a very different way from what we would come to using the lens of science. So this was really important to understand the depth of identity. And when you start to talk to people on a farm, very often they start to explain their farming system, business decisions that they are making through their identity. Um, and we've got a couple of quotes. I don't want you to linger on this to quote for too long, because frankly it's quite disturbing. But this gentleman was shooting his excess male calves. He, there was no market value for them. So he just shot them. Every morning he trooped out and shot them. And that, for him, 
negated the purpose of what he was doing. That's what hurt. It affronted his farmer identity. Now, this guy, if he didn't have bad luck, he would have had no luck at all. But that was the kind of problem that he was faced with. The logic of his business affronted his sense of what he was doing. My colleague Jane Mills collected these quotes from uh, talking to people about agri-environmental schemes. And you'll see that um, people you know, get out of their tractors with a spade. They don't like those two-metre margins because that's how they were brought up. It's a generational thing. So we, you're not battling the prescriptions of agri-environmental scheme X or agri-environmental scheme Y. You're battling somebody's identity of what it means to be what they do and who they are. And that is a very high barrier. This other chap at the bottom here, the world needs food. Now that's a mission. Yeah? That's a moral, ethical mission to get you out, in the bed, out of bed in the morning. I'm feeding the world. This is important. Yeah? You know, trumps everything else, doesn't it? You know, when I'm sat there just recording an interview with a clipboard, yeah, you're right, mate, my purposes are marginal. You've got a big purpose here. Now, that's a mission that motivates people. That's their identity. So no wonder with such a strong identity that we find that messages of policy, messages of change, are not necessarily received as we might be hoping. Because we are hoping that we will make a rational case, we will present some evidence, and somebody will totally have a light bulb moment and go... You're right. Let's go for it. So at the CCRI, with the investment, a lot of investment from uh, the EU and from DEFRA and from Natural England and other bodies, we spent a long time looking at agri-environmental schemes, looking at change, why people change, why they don't. And so we just used these three very simple intersecting ideas. Engagement, willingness and capacity. And that desired change is where these three th things intersect. So if you want to know the difference between engagement and willingness, I know I shouldn't drink so much. I'm sold on that argument. My willingness to change that is limited. Okay? <laughs> Equally, I may be sold on the idea that an agri-environmental scheme would be a good thing. My willingness to do it is limited. And then we also move to the point that I may not have the capacity to do this. I may not have the understanding. I may not have the equipment. I may not have the support. So getting all of those three things aligned is important and difficult. But when it does happen, you move to that point of desired change. Now, a lot of the time, a lot of our policies try to bypass willingness. You may not buy into this, but if you understand the argument and you have the capacity, we are going to incentivise you, or we are going to push you in whatever market mechanism we can find into you doing it. But that is always when we come back with the half-hearted. The one that immediately where that changes, we revert. We don't want to follow that through because we're not bought into that. So part of what we're doing is trying to examine the ways in which we start to change people's identity. To actually start to have a discussion that allows people to do things differently. Achieving change is hard. We all know that. We know that personally. We know that socially. Achieving change in a direction that we would all like to go is even harder. But, you know, and also notice here, I'm not talking about the content of this change. I'm talking about how we might have the mechanism of change. And first of all is identity verification. If you want to look at how conservation measures can go very badly wrong and alienate the population and not achieve their goals, just look at the common fisheries policy, which is, you know, devastated fishing communities, populations are not recovering, nobody's happy with it, environmentalists can't speak to fishermen, fishermen can't speak to others, people are still carrying on, the small players have been pushed out of the industry and the big players remain. So there's models of how not to do it there. And part of that is that you need to reaffirm people's identity, that people need to know that you're not asking them to stop farming. They're not going to be asked to be park keepers, as they might place it, or to be anything different. <laughs> they will still be farming, maybe differently, but farming. And that is so hugely important. Then groups. If you want to change, group work's a great way of doing it. Whether it's losing weight, uh, curbing your raging sort of addictions to anything, groups work. And groups of farmers are a very powerful tool because it's peer-to-peer -peer education peer-to-peer, -peer, and also creating those positive social norms that actually many times 
you can hear the negative is actually reinforced and spread between people very powerfully and quickly. Groups allow that to be combated. The other simple thing is, is this effective? Can you demonstrate this is effective? I certainly find this in my own puny attempts to battle my carbon footprint. Yeah? So I take the bus, I take the train, I save X number of kilograms of greenhouse gases, and then I look at the output of China. And I think, you know, did it make any difference? In a farming context, can we demonstrate to people that what they have done has made a sub sub substantive, significant difference? Because if you feel that your actions have efficacy, you're much more likely to go for it. Then there comes this question of trusted advisors and the co-production of knowledge. We're talking about big change. We're talking about change to your business, change to your personality, in the sense that your community identity, your personal identity, maybe your familial identity. I've certainly come across... Because normally, when I go to interview people, I go along and I arrange an interview, and then there may be one person there. Sometimes that's like the old man. I w went to an interview with family once, and the chap sat there, and I said, so where are your sons? And he said, oh, you passed them on the drive. <coughs> So I'm only getting the picture from the old man. and They've authorised him to speak about certain things. Other times you turn up and it's like the Waltons. <laughs> ten, pe you know, ten people sat around the table to make sure that nobody says anything that's not the agreed statement. So trust is really important and knowing who is important is really important. But also, we're increasingly working in the idea of the co-production of knowledge. Um, we've recently done an evaluation of the uh, scheme the Soil Association are running with the ORC. Uh, my colleague Julie Ingram is involved in many projects at the EU about co-production of knowledge. Now, this is certainly not a criticism of the science that we've seen today, the dedication and rigour that that has taken, but that is knowledge produced for people very often, rather than with people. And it's allowing people to actually participate in defining these problems and understanding them from their perspective that is also really important. Yes, we need very high top-level overviews, but we also need science that works alongside people. So that way we build trust, we build a way in which people can talk about science and be comfortable with it to work alongside it. And then the final thing, and this is not flippant, is positive societal feedback. Farmers need to feel the love. If you read the farming press, now I'm now lowering myself into a pit, but if you read the farming press, on occasion it would appear that the only negative views of farmers externally. And they're very often told that the only measure of what they do is a price for a commodity they sell. That very negative messaging makes change really hard. If people feel connected, if they feel that what they're doing is being affirmed by wider society, then change comes all the easier. So, I appreciate that this is a kind of sudden veer off to another direction of discussion, um, but hopefully that can inform some of our other debates. I've run very light on corporate badges, um, sponsors, logos, all of those kind of things. Uh, you can find out much more about CCRI on our website. We have slide shares, you can watch people, videos, all of the normal paraphernalia. But it's a whole bunch of social scientists who are working on how you work with food producers in the widest possible sense, how we create change. Um, so thank you very much for your attention at this late hour. Thank you.